You're in the water loop. <laughs> Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast helping water leaders to discover solutions and drive change. I'm the host, Travis Loop. This episode is part of a series, Funding to Fight Lead. There are perhaps 10 million lead service lines in the ground in the U.S., and it may cost $50 billion to remove them. The series explores financing lead service line replacement, technical assistance for under-resourced communities, and examples of successful approaches. This episode is about the menu of options. The ways to fund lead service line replacement and some of the key financial aspects are discussed in this episode with Cynthia Kohler of the Water Now Alliance and Tim Mayle of the Environmental Policy Innovation Center. Cynthia and Tim talk about the $15 billion for lead pipe removal from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act the use of municipal bonds to fund work on private property, the role of state and local policies, and help for communities in need. Before starting, I want to mention that Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet that is made possible by its supporters. I'm going to take the next couple of minutes to discuss the sponsors of this series, Blue Conduit, 120 Water, and LeadCopperRule.com, and then start the conversation. This episode is sponsored by Blue Conduit. Blue Conduit is a water analytics company that has developed a cutting edge, predictive machine learning approach to locate lead service lines, empowering local officials and their engineering partners with the information to efficiently remove those pipes. The company's solutions enable utilities to focus their resources on digging where the lead is accelerating the removal of this significant health concern and saving millions of dollars in avoided digs. Since 2016, the Blue Conduit team has worked with more than 100 municipalities and inventoried over 1.8 million service lines, which serve more than 4 million people. Visit blueconduit.com. This episode is sponsored by 120 Water. 120 Water is the only end-to-end solution for implementing the lead and copper rule revisions. They currently work with over 600 water systems, ranging from rural water communities that serve less than 3,000 people to major cities like Denver, Pittsburgh, and Newark. They also manage city and statewide drinking water programs, such as lead in schools and daycares. 120 Water is a digital water platform with cloud-based software, Products such as water testing kits, lead validation kits, and remediation kits, and services that water systems and state agencies use to execute water quality programs. Learn more at 120water.com. This episode is sponsored by LeadCopperRule.com. The Lead and Copper Rule doesn't just create compliance challenges for water utilities, it also creates several public information flashpoints that put the reputations of utilities at risk. LeadCopperRule.com can help your utility stay ahead of the Lead and Copper Rule for years to come. Their proven communication plans and products are ready in an instant, and their expert staff can guide your response to any lead information emergency. Be ready to protect the public's trust in your water from day one. Visit leadcopperrule.com today to set up your free initial consultation. You're in the water loop. So happy to be here with you, Cynthia and Tim, to talk about one of the pressing issues in our country, still dealing with lead and and lead pipes out there. Uh, Before we dig into the options for financing the removal of lead service lines, I want to just kind of set the table a little bit here, better understand the situation. Um, What's the latest estimate of how many lead service lines need to be replaced in the U.S., uh, and then maybe kind of tacking on what the cost is estimated for, for per line even. Tim, do you want to take a swing at that? Yeah, I'll jump in there. Um, you know, the most reasonable estimate, and it's really an estimate, is around 10 million lead pipes. 
Uh, it could be a couple million more, a couple million less. The good news is that there's uh, a federal regulation as well as state regulations that require a good inventory. So we'll, by 2024, early 2025, we'll have a more accurate estimate. But assume it's something like 10 million, mostly households, right? Mostly individual single family homes, some apartment buildings, few schools that have lead pipes, um, which is a lot. Um, also lead pipes in almost every other developed country as well. So America is not alone with this problem. And the replacement costs, you know, there's inflation right now, and so they're going up. But when EPA put out the last uh, regulation and did a, uh, an economic analysis, um, they pulled some data from, you know, sort of 2019, 2020, and the estimated average cost was about $4,700, with a range of anywhere down to $1,500 to take out an individual lead pipe, up to $10,000. Um, we're now seeing, you know, um, stories about, uh, pipe replacements potentially costing more than 20,000 in places like Chicago. Um, but I think more likely it's like the five to $10,000 range for a simple, uh, pipe replacement, you know, in somebody's front yard for a, you know, pretty small, reasonable sized front yard. Yeah. Math is not my strong suit. I'm a words communications person, but if you kind of multiply 10 million by 5,000, it's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, that's going to be required, yeah. right? That's like, yeah, is. is 50 billion well, the number that, that comes out if you do that math, roughly, right? Yep, that's uh, a reasonable number. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, so the, the goal of our conversation here is really to talk about kind of the, the menu of options for financing lead service line replacement uh, and this conversation is going to queue up follow-up episodes in this series. We'll, we'll really dig into those a little bit. But could could you start out by kind of talking about what are the, the most commonly used options for utilities to go about this work? Yeah, I might just jump in on that. Um, I'd say there are really um, three large buckets, right? There's of course the federal money, which can come in the form of either loans or grants. Until recently, it's been mostly loans um, through the state revolving funds that are established under the Federal Clean Water and Drinking Water Acts. Um, with the new legislation, um, the Infrastructure Act, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, um, there's a lot more federal, um, both federal grant and loan money. money. I'd say the second bucket, um, and I just don't, don't want to overlook this, is the property owners themselves, right? Those who pay, who own the private um, properties on which these lines are located, um, and they pay out of pocket some of those costs. But the third bucket, and this is the growing opportunity, is the utilities themselves that are increasingly realizing that the public health issues and the safe drinking water, um, lead and copper rule um, requirements means it will fall more and more to those utilities to figure out how to pay for those. So once you're in that utility space, um, there's a number of financing options. They can pay out of rates. That's where most of their revenue comes from. Um, circling back, they can, of course, access those federal and state grant and loan opportunities. Um, there's a very small role for philanthropy that is often discussed. Um, that's going to be generally around um, facilitation, you know, guarantee, loan guarantees, that kind of thing. Um, the biggest untapped opportunity for utilities is going to be accessing capital markets in the form of bond financing and other borrowing. Yeah. <laughs> Great, great overview there. I, I didn't even have that, you know, the, the homeowner themselves on that on that list. I was just <laughs> thinking big picture here because that's not going to happen super frequently, right? It's a it's a good expense for someone to take take on. Um, big news, you know, about a year ago was the uh, is the funding coming down that you mentioned. There's 15 billion, right, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act for lead work, uh, which is tremendous. That's a huge pot of money. Um, could, could you talk a little bit about that, that infusion, infusion of cash and how that's going to get out? What's the process for tapping into those funds and putting them to work? Tim? Yeah, so the, that money, the way it's traditionally gone out, and is, it, it's a very, very effective program, is that EPA transfers a relatively predictable amount of that money to each state each state has a staff that run uh, these loan slash grant programs. Um, the states are either with deadlines or continuously seeking applications from municipalities and uh, water systems, uh, drinking water systems for projects they want to do, capital projects they want to do. And then every year, 
each of those state agencies, you know, puts out a plan and says, this is what we're going to fund this year. This is why negotiates those, you know, loans and grants and, you know, away we go. And those can be really, really big projects, you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars, hundred million dollars, or they could be relatively small uh, pots of money. Many states have a portion of it set aside for rural communities. So places that might only have 10 or 20 or 50, you know, lead service lines all the way up to, you know, communities that have 100,000 or 50,000 lead service lines. So that's sort of generally the way the, the program will roll out. Um, in many states have been doing some amount of lead pipe replacement for a while. So they're pretty familiar with these kinds of projects through their state revolving loan funds. Other states have not. And so we're still roughly about half of the states haven't even put out like a, a draft plan yet for spending um, this last year's lead uh, pipe replacement monies. So, you know, again, in, in many states, this is relatively new. Many people are still just funding their inventories as opposed to actual replacements. So it's a work in progress in terms of getting this money to the ground to uh, to pay for placement projects. Hmm. Uh, two things pop into my head off of that. So I'm wondering about how the timing of the lead and copper rule and the the inventory requirements might be playing into that. Maybe maybe communities and states are so focused on that inventories piece and they're trying to get that done um, and then turn to work. Uh, I don't know if you have any reaction to that thought. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on that. I'm really worried that actually that is what states or what communities are doing is saying, like, we want to know where every pipe is before we start replacing. And um, it's just a missed opportunity, right? I mean, inflation is one reason why it's a missed opportunity. It's going to be more expensive. The other one is you've got local plumbers, you know, mom and pop operations that are looking for jobs right now who could start doing the work. Um, and, you know, there's 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 predictive tools and other ways that those inventories can get done a lot faster. So really enthusiastic about work from Newark to Denver to little towns like Edgerton, Wisconsin, that are just replacing, you know, what they know about and continuing to learn more about uh, the places, the neighborhoods that still need more surveying or more inventory. And there's pretty uh, there's pretty wide range of the number of lead pipes, even per capita from state to state, right? Uh, and so in some cases, this federal money is going to help some states deal with whatever their inventory is. In other states, they're going to have way more pipes than can be dealt with with the their portion of these dollars. Is that fair to say too? Uh, yeah, that's definitely fair. I mean, are you are you asking about what what happens when we have this gap in uh, federal? Well, funding? yeah, I mean that's that's where I'm headed because yeah. again, again to my good math skills here, right? We we said there's about fifty right. billion, let's just roughly say, needed to get all the lead pipes out. Fifteen billion from IIJA, so there's a thirty five billion dollar gap there. Uh, Cynthia, what's what else can municipalities do? Um, you kind of, I think right. you ticked it off. That's, and, that's a <laughs> I would say that's a low estimate of the gap. Mm. Um, but yeah, 50, you know, 35 billion, 50 billion, there's definitely going to be a gap. Um, so this is where utilities have a major opportunity to finance lead line replacements in the same way that they finance other key water infrastructure by going to the capital markets, specifically municipal bonds. Uh, and that has a number of advantages for them. To be clear, we're talking here about the 8,000 or so water utilities that serve about 95% of the population, not the thousands of tiny community service water providers that may not have bonding capacity. Um, but for those who do, this is a highly under-resourced, I mean, underutilized option that can maximize affordability as well as equity in their community. Um, this is because even with the increase in rates recently, municipal bonds are typically very low cost money and they spread the cost for lead laterals over decades. So the impact on rates is relatively um, low rather than having today's rate payers, uh, rate payers pick up the full cost of that burden. So um, we, can, we can talk more about how that works, but, um, but there is a great deal of private capital that is available to those utilities to access at relatively low cost. Mm. Uh, what about any kind of- hey, Travis, just Yes, just Tim, just absolutely. There for one second, you know, yeah. the, the agree with everything Cynthia said, but the other part of it is that it's pretty rare that Congress funds 100% of a solution at one time, mm. right? So the, the capital markets, yes, and local finance, yes, and the, S, the SRFs, the state revolving loan funds, $15 billion. The challenge we have is proving that we can actually you know, use all these solutions. And then we get to come back in five years and say, 
hey, does this actually matter to people, right? And, and the premise is that actually this really does matter to people. People want to know that their water does not have lead in it. And so there's a really strong argument that if we can make these pieces work together, that there's a case for the next tranche of money, right? So this is, this is not a hard sell where we're going to find, hey, five years from now, we spent all this money and nobody believes in it. There's a, people believe in it because they've stopped drinking their water, right? Because they're worried about lead. And so you can tell them you can drink your water again. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's right. I, you know, I, I always worry about um, this perception that it's one answer or the other. And I think we're all looking at these braided solutions. There's no community that's really going to do just one thing or just another thing. So, you know, even communities that are well resourced are going to be looking for whatever federal funds or state funds are available. So this is all about putting together, um, you know, a, a portfolio of funding options that's going to work for, for these different communities. Um, so, you know, my point was just that the, the option with municipal bonds has been, um, that's really a, a hugely untapped resource that, um, that is available. Um, and the question is really, can we get utilities past some of their concerns? About, because it's an unusual way to be funding um, uh, infrastructure on private property, but that is a huge part of the solution, not just to lead service lines, but to water infrastructure going forward. Yeah. Well, Tim, I, I like your point that maybe this 15 billion is just like the, the first allowance uh, to, for the sector and see how they do. And, and, and then maybe because this is such a priority, there can be more to follow. Cynthia, to your point about the bonds, what, what about like the, maybe there's some longstanding perception around using public dollars for work on private property, you know, by municipal utilities. Uh, is, is, is that still out there? Is that still a stigma, if you will, or, or a belief that you shouldn't do that? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd call it a stigma. Hmm. I would call it, a, you know, a, a way of doing business, right? So the barrier to using bond dollars, and in many places, even SRF loans for private property lead lines has been this widespread, but not always accurate perception that public utilities can only borrow to finance tangible fixed assets. Um, generally that the utility itself owns and operates. But in fact, the rules provide for an alternative that allows public agencies to use borrowed funds to pay for investments on private properties that serve a public purpose, which obviously replacing lead laterals does. So um, to take a long story and make it short, Water Now worked with GASB, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, um, that sets rules for public entities nationwide. GASB already had in place an alternative to standard accounting known as GASB Statement 62 um, that allows local entities to capitalize spending for activities that don't result in tangible assets, but still secure investments for bondholders um, because they're secured by rates. So we were able to persuade GASB to issue guidance specifically for water utilities, um, water pro pu you know, public water providers, stating that this GASB 62 approach could be used by them to finance investments on private properties. So that is no longer an impediment. That said, it's still um, not quite yet in wide use. Um, there are other challenges, of course, including state public financing laws, um, but we've put together a database um, of all of those statutes. And in most places, um, they do allow, again, governments to use public dollars on private property when it's for a primarily public purpose. So we're really at the point now where um, I'm not saying there aren't impediments or speed bumps, as uh, mm. we heard in our in our uh, webinar yesterday, but they are almost in in most cases they are manageable. So we're really dealing with a question of education, outreach, and perception. Mm. Uh, examples of cities that have taken this approach, you know, and have shown that this is this is possible and and successful. Right. Well, um, as as uh, Tim alluded to, the poster child for this is Denver Water. Mm -hmm. So we work pretty closely with Denver Water. Um, they um, uh, they wanted to find an alternative to EPA standard chemical treatment to address lead in drinking water um, to avoid a number of adverse impacts that would flow to its system and downstream users. So once the utility decided that it wanted to replace, you know, all of the sixty to eighty thousand lead lines in its service area. Then it turned to figuring out, well, how do we pay for these? And we work with them to adopt um, the GASB 62 approach. So as a result, um, Denver moved forward with bond financing for its lead program. And in combination with the available state and federal dollars, um, it's going to be able to generate the upfront cash that it needs to accelerate this program and replace its lead lines. 
That means it now anticipates um, replacing all of those lines in 10 to 15 years instead of the decades it would have taken otherwise. So, I mean, this is, you know, it's not rocket science. If you've got cash up front, you can do more. I mean, Tim's point about implementation and all of that, those are, those are real issues. But if you've got the cash up front, you've got at least the capacity and the possibility of moving forward with those um, replacements at a much faster rate than you would otherwise. Hmm. So Denver Water, we do see it as the poster child for this. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious to circle back to like the state role here. Uh, and when it comes to, to financing, getting these, these lead pipes out of the ground, what role do state laws, policies play? Uh, you know, it, it's a pretty diverse landscape out there, but how does that impact the, the menu of funding financing options? Tim, do you have any thoughts on that one to start? Yeah, I mean, uh, states have done, a number of states, usually driven by crisis, have, uh, have done amazing things. New Jersey, Michigan, um, states with, with statewide mandates for lead replacement, um, Illinois, Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin, for example, fixing the private property issue that, um, that Cynthia mentioned. Um, so a number of those states, New York, New York, uh, just the, the um, voters through a referendum put together a bond that's going to finance lead pipe replacement, statewide bond, and other things in water. So there's a number of really important initiatives and in states that are, are um, really leading the charge. The White House just announced a partnership with four states um, last week called the, the, um, the Lead Pipe Replacement Accelerator, um, places like Connecticut, again, Wisconsin, um, putting their resources, their um, human capital and know-how, uh, their bond markets and their um, and their SRF funds together with EPAs to you know to accelerate lead pipe replacement. So hmm. the state actions are really key. Um, I don't know if you were going to ask this, but there's state actions, and then there's things like local initiatives. You know, for example, in Newark, mandating that uh, landlords um, uh, allow lead pipes to be replaced in rental buildings. Um, there are places, uh, uh, communities, again, at the city level and in Illinois and other states where um, the tenant, you know, permission from the tenant is enough to allow a lead pipe to be replaced. You don't have to have the house owner. It's, you know, so many of these lead pipes are in rental housing. So there's, there's enormous things that um, a local government and state government can do, both on the financing side and, and then in terms of just facilitating the, con the construction project. Yeah. Cynthia, any thoughts on that that state level, the state role in kind of the funding finance puzzle? Yeah, I really agree with Tim. I think there is a significant state role. He's outlined the positives, um, and there's a, there's a great deal they can do. Um, you also have to be looking out for the challenges. State laws can also be obstacles. Um, there's a lot of state public financing rules that were adopted for very good reasons to avoid, you know, corruption and you know self dealing. You know, that's where all of the um, concern about using public money on private property comes from. So um, often you need um, you need states to be um, either doing carve outs to that specifically to allow for this kind of spending on private property or the kinds of mandates that Tim was talking about. Um, but you need to be working within the, you know, the, the structure of the state and local rules. So um, there's a lot that they um, they can be doing to facilitate um, moving forward. And, um, you know, as I may have mentioned we've done a 50 um, state database that can be a resource for localities trying to figure out well what exactly are my state rules and is there a problem for example this was not an issue in colorado there just there wasn't um, a barrier of any kind so um sometimes states just need to not be a problem and sometimes they actually need to be engaged um proactively hmm. we're seeing we're seeing more and more of that as tim laid out sure one of the, this has kind of been mentioned here throughout the conversation, but it's something I'm always uh, very attuned to. Uh, there's a lot of under-resourced communities. There's a lot of very small systems, uh, places that don't even have the staff really to figure out how to start going on this. Uh, what What's going on to, you know, to get funding to those places and to give them kind of the technical assistance to use that funding and get this work going? Uh, Tim, maybe you can speak to that one first. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the city of Edgerton, Wisconsin before, you know, just a couple thousand people in Edgerton. They have something like 300 lead pipes. They're 200 pipes into the replacement process, 100 to go. I think they could be done in 2024. A lot of that work has been possible because Wisconsin has used some of the funding that came through during COVID recovery uh, to make grants through to uh, small towns and large towns uh, throughout the state to replace lead pipes. 
Um, so that's happening in places um, like Wisconsin, uh, where the state has put resources behind um, those efforts. Um, and again, it, it's often these these efforts that take, it's, so there's just a small number of pipes, right? So truly you can have a local business, a small set of plumbers um, do the work. Um, there are, you know, the estimates that we use are there's like 11,000 communities, um, most, as Cynthia said, most very small that have lead pipes in the country. So, you know, the question is if we take $15 billion plus the bond market, plus state money, plus homeowner monies, can we knock that total down from 11,000 to 8,000 or 6,000 or 5,000 um, to get pipes out of the really small places? I think one of the challenges is that the state revolving loan fund and our analyses in the past have shown this, it's disproportionately goes to very large cities. They have the staff to apply for the money, which can be really complicated to get access to. Um, and uh, so small cities have fewer options, right, to, to get money. And it, you know, it's pretty difficult to justify a lot of paperwork for a loan of, you know, let's say $100,000 um, and doing $100,000, $100,000 loans. So we definitely need more, more policy structures, you know, approved at the state level or at the federal level um, with these state revolving loan funds to be able to make smaller allocations to small communities to get the pipes out without having to repeat the paperwork, you know, every time for, uh, for these loan funds. It's where we think public-private partnerships make a lot of sense. Um, and some of the SRFs, although not all, can allow things like intermunicipal organizations to receive money. So you could, um, you could make a loan or a grant to uh, an intergovernmental organization like a council of governments um, or metropolitan authority to then be able to distribute the money to small communities. Um, and with, you know, I mean, the, the prize at the end of this is communities being able to say, you can buy a house in our town, you live in our town and there's no lead pipes. And we're, mm. we're confident that we've gotten, uh, nearly every one. And if you find one, we'll take it out. Right? Like that's, that's what we're trying to, to get done. And the, the very small communities just don't have those tools. Um, we put together a guide I, I had a, a couple of months ago called from the ground up that provided tips for both small and large communities in terms of financing and and implementing lead pipe replacement, but there's a lot more work to be done for small communities. Yeah, sure. Uh, we've we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of the finance options, a lot of the wrinkles. Um, is there any other challenges? Are there any other challenges of concern uh, for for most water utilities when it comes to paying for lead service line replacements? Is there anything out there that should be thrown into this mix, Cynthia? Um, I mean, I think generally there are questions, a lot of utilities still have questions about whether they should be in the business of paying for, um, the removal of lines that are on private property. Mm. I mean, there's a cultural issue there, right? This is, these are private properties. I think this is a unique situation because most homeowners didn't say, I'm going to go out and put a lead line, you know, under my driveway or my garden or what, you know, <laughs> Th these were choices made by others long, long ago. So it's not. Um, the typical situation where, um, you know, a homeowner or, a, you know, an apartment renter um, even knows anything about this choice. So I think, but on the other hand, utilities do have, many utilities um, are not yet at the point where they're ready to say, we want to take responsibility for these lead lines. Many are, you know, you look at Newark, you look at Cincinnati, Madison, Chicago. I mean, there are a lot of places, you know, Denver uh, that have said, you know, we believe this is part of our community and we're going to do this. So I want to you know, um, you know, give props to those utilities that are there. But I think this is a cultural change um, that's going to take a little bit of time. I think these federal bills are a big incentive. Um, I think the lead and copper rule make a big difference. But um, I think we are talking about a change in perception. And then I didn't want to, I wanted to build a little bit on what Tim just said. I think the other piece of this is just finding the resources. So in addition to all of the great, um, you know, points that Tim just made, there's a very significant role, and I, I see this really growing. You know, groups like Water Now, Tim's group is doing this too. You know, we engage directly with, um, and not just the tiny towns, but even the medium-sized towns that aren't really very well resourced. They look at the federal, you know, process to like, you know, try to get even a modest grant, and it's overwhelming. So I think a big issue um, in terms of financing is that it's like, where does that capacity comes from? Come from to actually go out and um, you know, and, and get the financing we need, whether it's SRF loans or water smart loans or doing the work that needs to be done to do an impact bond or a green bond or even just a regular bond. And there's that's where I see a, a very growing role for um, NGOs, you know, the environmental finance centers, 
where there's enormous opportunity to be working in partnerships to be accelerating the pace at which funds from all of these different graded sources can flow to these communities. And not just in getting the funds, but in actually figuring out how to make it happen. Um, so I think that capacity building um, is, a real, is a real focus um, when you're talking to utilities about um, how to pay for these, um, you know, to pay for these lead line replacements. Yeah. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to ask about resources for people. You both have mentioned a couple different tools, publications, and so forth. You can mention those again, but I just want to leave people with some places they could go to learn more about uh, you know the financing options and issues that were discussed in this conversation. Tim, um, you want to mention some stuff? Yeah. Um, our report from the ground up, again, tips for local government, uh, state SRF program managers, um, uh, our website, which is environmental or policy innovation.org, um, slash lead free water has a whole bunch of resources, probably about a dozen publications. Um, there's a new, uh, tape, um, of a white house led summit that includes remarks from 15 mayors without 15 mayors, uh, on their efforts to replace lead pipes, which is a wealth of stories that other people can follow. Um, so those are some of the resources that exist. There's lots of resources yeah. and, you know, I think when you, know, you think about the the, uh, the the million mile club for people who are frequent flyers on airplanes, we want there to be a thousand thousand pipe replacement um, mayor clubs, right? Uh. Where people feel like we've made progress. We're a bunch of the way there. We can keep going. Yeah, Cynthia, any any uh, resources you want to mention, or just recap some of the ones you talked about in this conversation? Sure. Our our primary platform is called Tap into Resilience, and it is a very um, robust, very deep set of resources, primarily aimed at public water utility um, leadership, staff, you know, executive leadership. Um, so on lead, but also on the broader issues associated with financing and accounting and generally um, implementing um, infrastructure on private properties. So it goes very deep. There's modules specifically on lead. We also have an expert panel that is available pro bono. So if there's some sort of discrete issue um, we have sort of a, a set of several dozen experts that are available. Um, we also have a set of webinars. Um, we just did one yesterday with one of Tim's colleagues at Epic. So those are available on our website as well. And um, you know, like Tim, we've also got a, a vast resource library with an interactive map showing where different communities are doing different things. That's all available. Um, you know, it's all open source on our on the Tap and Resilience website. So I, uh, I invite everybody to check it out. Fantastic. Uh, a wealth of information in this conversation. This is the first episode of a six-part series diving into the options for financing lead service line replacement. So definitely encourage everyone to stay tuned. We're going to dive deeper into these topics that we, we touched on today. But Cynthia and Tim, thank you both so much. Thank Thanks, you, Travis. Tim. I'm really yeah. grateful that you're doing the series. It's great. Thank you for listening to this episode, and thanks to the sponsors, Blue Conduit, 120 Water, and LeadCopperRule.com. For all of our content, please visit Waterloop.org. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.